It's so nice to have you here. I'm so glad you're with us. Um, yesterday, I had a great experience. The newest member of our congregation, three months old, Miles, uh, had his blessing ceremony yesterday. And um, it's probably one of my most favorite things to do as a religious science minister. Um, I think it's just because I really like babies, you know? I see this little guy, he was three months old yesterday. And you know, he's got these perfect, perfect little hands and these perfect little feet and these teeny, tiny little fingers. And, and, and even on tiny, tiny him, I mean, he's about the size of a burrito, right? <laughs> he, um, you see the perfection of God because there's little eyebrows and little eyelashes and these tiny little hairs. It's just, you know, how could you not believe in God? There had to be some organizing, intelligent principle to create something so beautiful and wonderful and perfect that when everybody saw, their response immediately was love. You know, it, 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 was, it was just great. It was just a wonderful thing. We identify God with love, and we talk about that all the time. And our goal is for that love of God to just be flowing through us, I believe, all the time. Uh, because it seems to me that it is in response to love that that's when we really come alive. So think about that in your life, where love is really present, or situations where we're with people we love, or doing what we love. I think we really, really wake up and come alive. And it seems to me that the other side of that coin is that the absence of love actually distorts us. That that's where we always seem to get in trouble in life, when we're not coming from that loving place first. We maybe make it second or third on the list, but I got a couple other priorities, so I'll put love second or third, and I think that's really where we get into trouble. Now, it's interesting to me that the Hebrew people often called God the rock. Yeah, uh, and we see that a lot in Psalms, in Proverbs. And you know, what do you do with a rock? You stand on a rock. A rock is firm. It's gonna give you a foundation. It's not gonna let us down. Right? And so uh, Plotinus, one of the ancient Greek philosophers, who is one of Ernest Holmes' favorites, Ernest Holmes quotes Plotinus in the textbook more than 20 times. He loved Plotinus. Maybe it was the only Greek philosophy book he had. I don't know, but he really liked Plotinus. I, I don't think so. He, he had lots of books. But Plotinus said, the infinite and inexhaustible ground of being. That phrase, the infinite and inexhaustible ground of being. I think for us, we are grounded in God. You know, that's, that's what we are. And the more we become what we are intended to be, I believe the more of God we reveal in, in the life of our experience, right? So the more we become what it is that we intuitively, instinctually feel we are to be, we are to do, we are to express here on life, then the more God gets revealed because God is the source of life. Part of how we worship God, I think, is by living fully. See, I think this idea of glorifying God is very interesting because God is not outside. God is not separate from us. God is right where we are. And so how could I possibly glorify God? Well, I think, well, the best way to do that is to live fully, to make the most of this life experience. So God is the source of love, and I worship God by loving lavishly. Let's, I like that word, lavish. I say loving in a lavish way. All right, so I have to live fully, and I have to love lavishly or abundantly, and also, all this while, know that God is the ground of my being. I worship God by being everything I can be, by absolutely showing up fully for my own life experience, because the more fully I be who I am, the more I make God visible. Did you see the news this week? I thought this was great. This was totally the universe supporting my talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it seems this week off of Cape Cod, uh, a humpback whale swallowed a man. Really, this is true. Honest to God, this really happened. A man named Michael Packard, he was off of uh, Provincetown in uh, the end of Cape Cod. He was a lobster fisherman and he was going diving you know, probably to work on his traps or something like that. And uh, while he did that, there was a humpbacked whale that just opened its massive mouth, moved forward, and encompassed him fully and completely for between 20 to 30 seconds, he says. Uh, he felt like he'd been hit by a Mack truck. Hmm? And then the whale spit him out. <laughs> Feet first. Feet first, it sh opened its mouth, shook its head, 
and shot the guy out. <laughs> he was very thankful to be home again. Uh, so I was thinking about this situation, and I was thinking, in the whale, this man thought of what was most important to him. He said, he, he just kept thinking about his wife and his two sons, and his wife and his two sons, and his wife and his two sons. And isn't that interesting how when, when it gets really, really important for us, we go right to what's really important, you know? Like, like what, what does it all come down to? The people I love. Uh, when I look at the spiritual masters that we appreciate and acknowledge all of from different traditions, I see people who are alive. I see people who are loving. Um, I see people who are being all that they can possibly be, doing what they came here to do. In Science of Mind, our teaching is all about, yes, you can be all that you can be. You can do what you came here to do. People are spiritually questing right now on Earth like never before. Hmm? Now, when I talk about the Bible, I believe that every character in the Bible is within us. They're all facets of us. They're all aspects of us. So Charles Fillmore said, Whoever expects failure, if you expect bad luck or ill of any kind in body or affairs, that person is being Jonah. Jonah is an Old Testament prophet. Um, it's a very small book in the Old Testament, just over two pages. Um, so whoever expects failure, bad luck, or ill of any kind in body or affairs is Jonah. Charles Fillmore was the founder of Unity. He wrote, put together this metaphysical Bible dictionary that we're very fond of. You know, in, um, in the Hebrew tradition, there's what's called Midrash, which is the telling of stories of their past, magnified to try to capture the essence of the experience that they had. Um, so I think the purpose of this tiny little book of Jonah in the Old Testament uh, is that the God of Israel is the God of the whole world. This is what Jonah is saying. He's basically saying one God, right? He doesn't use those exact words, but he's saying that the God of Israel is the God of the whole world and that this God is a forgiving God who has mercy upon the wicked whom he forgives because they repented from their evil ways. All right, remember, this is the Old Testament. So the prophets of old were valued, that what they had to share was valued because they got their information from visions and dreams and personal revelations. And people respected that. If you just said, I had a good idea, people were not interested in it. But if you said, I had a dream, or I've had a revelation, or I've had a vision. People wanted to know what you vi had a vision of if you were a prophet. So God says to Jonah to go to Nineveh. The people of Nineveh have become really wicked people. They are just bad, you know? And he wants, God wants Jonah to go to Nineveh and talk to these people, to get them on the right path. And Jonah wants nothing to do with this. You know, it just doesn't sound like a good time to him. It's like, you want me to do what? And I think of all the times when I feel the impress of spirit suggesting, telling, impelling, kicking me forward to do something, and I don't want to do it. You know, so, so I could kind of relate to that. So instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah decides that he will get out from under God's view and he'll go, uh, he'll take a ship instead, and he'll go to Tarshish to avoid God. So he gets on this ship, but once the ship is out, they uh, encounter a tempest, this horrific storm. And now remember, people are very superstitious. And so they're convinced that they are being punished because of someone or something that's on the ship. And they go to Jonah and says, what gives with you, buddy? You're the odd man out here. What's going on? And Jonah says, okay, well, I'm trying to avoid God. So they throw him overboard, basically. I mean, that's what the story goes, you know? It's like, oh, okay, we understand. So you're the problem. Your good is elsewhere, go to it quickly, is basically what they say to Jonah, right? Yeah, God has good for you, it's elsewhere, go to it. Not on our ship. So they throw Jonah overboard, and that is, in fact, when... He is swallowed by a fish. Now, in this story in the Old Testament, Jonah is swallowed by a fish for three days and nights. 
And here's the thing, of course, that while Jonah is in the belly of the fish, the belly of the whale, as we say, he prays. He prays, and he prays, and he prays. And eventually what happens after three days, okay, so this is maybe a little foreshadowing of what's going to happen eventually in the New Testament with Jesus, that, that three days and three nights in the whale, three days, three nights in the cave or in the tomb, uh, the whale spits him out, just like this guy on Cape Cod. <laughs> this could be a trend. <laughs> I'm just thinking now, if I were ever swimming and I saw a whale, would I have the presence of mind to say, Jonah, this guy on Cape Cod, if the whale swallows me, I'll probably be spit out. <laughs> but then I think about it, and I think, wait, we only have two accounts of people being spit out. <laughs> there, could be, there could, in fact, be a lot more accounts of people who were digested by the whale, <laughs> and, and, we would not, and we would not even know. So, so I say to you that for myself, honestly, I felt like that time of COVID when we were locked down and it felt like we couldn't see anybody and we couldn't go anywhere and we couldn't do anything, that kind of felt like being in the belly of the whale to me. It felt like I had been swallowed up, not every day, but some days, like I had been swallowed up by a darkness that I did not know what I could do about that. And one of the things that would come to me again and again is I would think about the story of King Solomon. And King Solomon in the Old Testament um, asked a wise person to say something to him that on a good day, um, would if he was way up, it would bring him to a level place of sanity. And if he was way down, it would also bring him up to a place of sanity. And um, this wise person came to Solomon and apparently inscribed on a ring for him this too shall pass. Now, that's what I tried to remember during COVID, and I think it's why eventually I personally got spit out of the belly of the whale, because I do feel like I'm out of it now. I really do. I mean, I'm still wearing a mask out in the world and doing the things that I think are responsible to do, but you know, go back to what Phil Moore says, whoever expects failure, if we think we have bad luck or ill will, coming toward us, you know, then we have succumbed to the whale. We have just moved in. In fact, not only have we moved into the whale, we've set up a nice little sofa with some pillows and, you know, a throw rug and maybe a small TV there so we can, you know, make the most of our time in the whale. I think the whole point of this story is that Jonah didn't listen to what was being given to him in the first place, right? If he just listened to God in the first place, he could have gone to Nineveh, talked the people up, and then he could have gone on a little trip, you know? But no, he had to do it his way. So here's the thing that I notice is that God's way usually works and mine often does not. I'm embarrassed, it's my confession, but often, you know, I mean, it, my way does not work so well because if you think about it, our way is almost always going to be based on what we've done in the past, right? And so if we keep doing what we've done, we're going to keep getting what we've gotten. So why would we think we're going to get a different result doing that this particular time? This too shall pass. So I would hold for all of us that we have probably spent plenty of time in the belly of the whale. Um, and we don't want to, but I suspect that we may visit there again. At some point down the road, who knows? You know, at just at any point in our life where we feel, you know, like we are just having a, a, a run of bad luck, or we're just being incredibly negative about our life, or we just know we're involved in something and it's going to fall flat on its face, it's going to be a huge failure. That is where we have to tell ourselves, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. With God, all things, all things are possible. And oh, thank God, I have the last page of my talk. I thought I forgot it, you know? <laughs> So what I invite you to do now is to just turn your attention inward with me for a moment, okay? And so as we come still together, bring your awareness to the pattern of your breathing. Notice the in-breath, notice the out-breath. You might even say to yourself silently, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. And so just notice your breathing, because it's really at the point of our breath where the highest God and the innermost God become one God. And so I would invite you to accept these words for yourself this morning. I am renewed, authorized and cleansed by the authority of the living spirit within me. 
My path in life is ordered, guided, and blessed. I am a worthy vessel for God's Spirit today. I am a willing vessel for God's Spirit today. I have been shaped and molded by God's love, and I am available for God's love to be accomplished by means of me. I'm equipped with the skill, the knowledge, the ability to carry out the life assignments that God has given to me with such love. I now go forth peacefully, joyfully, and lovingly. I'm bestowed with an abundance of good things in all of my affairs and in every aspect of my world. I now go forth with the blessed assurance that I shall never again forget that it is the spirit of the Father, Mother, God within me that has anointed me. So recognizing our oneness with this Father, Mother, Spirit, and knowing we are connected with each other, I speak this word for us today. And whatever troubles us, wherever we have perhaps been in the belly of the whale, we place that on the altar, the altar in our own heart, knowing that with God, all things are possible. We give our attention to God. We think about God instead. We remind ourselves that the difficulty that we experience, this too shall pass. Like it says in the Bible, it came to pass. It does not say it came to stay. And so I claim for each and every one of us healing spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. We include in our prayer today our family members and friends, those we love and hold near and dear. We see them in our mind's eye, and we know that the principle of God surrounds and fills them every step of their journey. They are blessed, healed, and whole. We bless our church, all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. I know we are blessed by being together. And so it is with an open, gracious, full heart, I say thank you, God, for perfect healing in each and every one of our lives. And I release this word into God's perfect law, the law of mind action. It does exactly as we believe, and we do believe. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen. All right, let's sing one time once. All right, I invite you to hold your gift over your heart and we'll say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you very much.